For those of you who don't know me, I'm Rocco. Um, I did my degree in mathematics, masters in mathematics, and masters in informatics. Um, I did some time at the Singularity Institute being a, a visiting fellow, so I spent some time actually trying to come up with a probabilistic model of the future as well as doing sort of odds and ends like cleaning the kitchen. Um, so, I, I, I probably know, I also spent some time at the Future of Humanity Institute with Nick Bostrom and Anders Sandberg, who I'm sad to see isn't here. Um, so, I know a few things about this, but um, I guess, you know, the, the, the sort of, the, the, the standard is low. Most people know nothing at all about the future. Um, I, I was talking to a woman downstairs who was coming here for an interview for some kind of academic course, and I asked her, what do you think? London's going to be like in 2100, and she said, oh, well, I think we might have flying cars. And when I told her that flying cars had already existed for about 30, 40 years, she was really shocked, actually. Yeah. Um, of course, they're very unsafe. That's why we don't actually usually use them, but you can buy them. Um, anyway, so, yes, important point. Um, please, if people could save their questions until the end, because we are a bit short on time, um, I'll try to answer questions as I can towards the end. Okay, so... Paul's talk was about methods, it was about how to think sanely, and, and hopefully now that you've sort of, you know, maybe digested that a little bit, or maybe, you know, in a week's time after you've followed up his links and maybe looked at some papers, you'll have digested it a little bit, um, you'll have better methods than the average person. You'll still be insane, but you'll be less insane than most people are, which is good. Um, when I say insane, I mean somewhat jokingly, but I mean that you will come up with probability distributions that violate the laws of probability theory, and you will be susceptible to, you know, framing effects and base rate neglect and all these fallacies. You'll just be a little bit less susceptible, and, and it's okay to make those mistakes. It's very important that you, that you sort of come out and say, I am less wrong than everybody else, but I'm still wrong a lot. Because if you make it part of your identity to not be wrong, then it just makes it even harder to improve. So, okay, so Paul's spoken about these methods. I'm going to try and quickly go through what those methods actually say about our future in particular, right? They're general methods. They cover very general scenarios. You know, a Roman emperor could have used them. But what about today? What about here, London, 2010? What can we predict about the next 90, 100, 200 years of our civilization? And also, what policy implications does that have? What, is, what should the government be doing? What should groups like the Singularity Institute or the Future of Humanity Institute be doing? And what could you be doing to help other people in this world, which is susceptible to the risks and the things, so uh, act for the benefits of technology? And what can you do to help yourself? So I'm, I'm hopefully going to try and answer all of that, at least provisionally. So, um, as Paul was saying, uh, you need to use probabilities. What, what you really need to use is, is what's called a probability distribution over outcomes. So, if we're thinking about the future, are we going to have flying cars in 2100, right? We might, we might not. We might be in a post-nuclear apocalyptic world. We certainly won't have any flying cars then. Um, so, we need a probability of that, right? And there might be more than one outcome we're interested in. We might be interested in the speed of the fastest car we'll have in 2100. So what you need is a probability distribution over speeds. So you cut the speeds up into little bins, and you assign a probability to each bin, right? And then this, of course, also changes over time, because you expect the speed of the fastest car or the fastest computer to maybe increase over time or decrease or whatever. So these probability distributions over the state of the world, because that is in general the most, the most general thing you can think about, what is the world as a whole going to be like, they are constrained by sort of common sense and also constrained by what experts tell you, okay? So, um, if experts are telling you that the laws of thermodynamics say that you can't have a perpetual motion machine, it would seem a little bit silly to assign a 90% probability to having a perpetual motion machine next year, right? You should really probably have that probability very low. Um, but of course, those constraints don't really determine your probability distribution, right? You know, th there's more to it than that. So we, so we need these prior probability distributions. And a prior, which you may have gleaned from, from Paul's talk, is a bit like a base rate. It's a bit like what you think the world is like before you really even consider any of the evidence. Um, okay, so I'm going to beat on bottom line reasoning again, because it's very important in futurism if you take 
maybe a transhumanist perspective, that you don't end up as a transhumanistic bottom line reasoner, where basically what you do is you interpret every piece of evidence as a reason as to why technology is going to be both quick in coming and, and appearing and also beneficial. Because if you've already decided that that's what you're going to argue in favour of, you're useless. You're like, you're like a rock that you throw arguments at and it's just got transhumanism is great written on it and it doesn't respond. Right? It's very important to avoid that. It's also important to avoid being a sceptical bottom line reason. I think there are fewer people who've fallen prey to that fallacy, but I still think there are some. So it's very important that, you know, if you see evidence that really seems to suggest that things are progressing quickly, then you actually update on that evidence. Um, and, and the idea is that, you know, this, this, this is the thing that Paul again talked about at the end of his talk, you have a faculty already innately in order to argue in favour of a preferred bottom line. But if you try to use that faculty to make, to come to conclusions and then base life decisions upon those conclusions, you are hurting yourself, not your rhetorical opponent. They may be hurting you as well, but you're hurting yourself by, by using bottom line reasoning. Okay, so just to, to move to a bit of an example now, does, does anyone care to guess what book this, this graph comes from? <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll give you a clue. Okay. Anyone? <laughs> yes, it's from The Singularity is Near. So this is Ray Kurzweil's graph of, um, uh, what is it, calculations per second per thousand dollars on a scale where each interval is two orders of magnitude. And, and there's this sort of nice, clean, <coughs> sort of, you know, straight white line going through all of these data points. And it, it's almost like it's a law of physics. Now, I don't want to go too hardcore against this, but, you know, I mean, can we really just extrapolate this nice clear white line out, you know, another hundred years like that? Well, some people would say not. Some people would say that, and I, I've heard people say that some people have said Moore's Law will definitely hit a wall in, in, in 10 years' time. Definitely. Or 20 years' time. You know, there's no way Moore's Law can carry on. I've been on. hearing that for 20 years. Me too. <laughs> I'm, I mean, I'm sure there's somebody who said it 20 years ago, right? Okay, but, but what's the correct answer to this, this, this sort of almost um, uh, representative debate of the debate between transhumanists and the sceptics? And I think the correct answer is a probability distribution over computing power at each particular year in the future, right? So one way that you could come up with a good prior probability distribution for that for what that probability distribution should be before you can really consider any evidence is Laplace's rule of succession. And this is the way Laplace's rule of succession works. So we imagine that there's some process, and I'm going to use the process that ends Moore's law as the example here, but uh, you can use any process. And uh, it, it's a process that continues in time. We're going to assume that, that this, this thing happens every decade. So every decade something happens. And in fact, we're just going to assume it's somebody tossing a coin with an unknown bias. So maybe it's got a magnet in it that makes it more likely to come up heads than not, or vice versa. Um, and we're going to say that coin, that bias coin, has an unknown probability P of coming up heads. Now that's not what actually happens when reality decides whether Moore's law will stop or not. What actually happens is engineers consider ways of constructing new circuits and blah, 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 blah. Very complicated. But as our prior, we're just going to consider this simple process. And we're going to say, we're going to have what's called a uniform prior distribution on 0, 1, which means that we're, not, we're saying we're completely unsure as to what the probability of this bias on the coin is. And in particular, it's equally likely to be any particular percentage of bias. OK. And the evidence that we're then going to look at is the fact that simply we've had roughly six decades of Moore's Law, and the coin has never come up heads yet. Moore's Law has not stopped so far. right? You do the maths, and that's a little bit complicated, so I'm not going to bore you with it. And the formula is S plus 1 over N plus 2, where S is the number of times the process has, has succeeded, the number of times Moore's Law has ended, which is 0, because it hasn't ended, and N is the number of trials. Right? So that is your probability that it will end in the next decade. And if you, if you do math in this case, um, the probability of Moore's Law ending in the next decade comes out as 1 in 8. Right? So that's a pretty, I would say, a pretty simplistic way of looking at things, but I think probably more accurate than most people who've exposed themselves to many more arguments and much more data. And then if you lump things differently into 20-year intervals, 
um, you can say the probability of it ending in 20 years is 1 in 5. Now then, once you've got that, you can then maybe consider more arguments. You can say, well, you know, I assign particularly high credence to three-dimensional computing coming around. So maybe when I draw my probability distribution, I want to up the probability mass in the region that's between 15 and 30 years from now for Moore's law continuing. Okay, but, but that, that's a sort of, I would say a fairly simple and elegant way to, to prevent yourself from engaging in bottom line reasoning. So we have this, um, thank you, I just have your laptop. Yep, sure. We have this uh, web application called The Uncertain Future. I tell you, while we're loading this, can everyone just stand up and sit down? Just, just go on, everyone stand up, go on. Everyone stand up. Actually, I tell you what, if you can, jump up a few times. Just, just like this, go on. Go on. Okay. Yeah. It's a de-biasing technique, okay? It okay. makes you less biased. <laughs> okay, everyone sit down. Um, right. So, now that I've got everyone's attention again, um, <laughs> the Singularity Institute spent some time um, building this web application which you can go to and that the address, just put into your address bar, www.theuncertainfuture, all one word, .com, and you too can be a probabilistic prognosticator about the future. So you just click this big ready to start button here, and uh, hopefully this application should load smoothly. Yep, it's working. So there are 10 different probability distributions that you're going to enter here in these 10 different tabs. And you just click next here, and you'll go to the next tab. So what's the probability that AI is possible in principle, where we might define AI to be a computer program that can uh, pass the Turing test and could replace people in jobs if it were given a robotic body? I mean, we, we're going to go with 99% here, people? Or are we down a bit, up a bit? Are you anchoring us? <laughs> yes, I'm anchoring, but but, but I, I, I don't care, yeah. right? I mean, we're just... 5%. 5%. Any, any other offers? <laughs> Is it the probability in principle that at some, some stage in the next... Ever. Well, no, it doesn't even have to actually happen. It just has to be in, in principle possible to build a machine that passes the Turing test. We've, we've heard an 80. 100%, one example. Yeah. Uh, yeah, all right. Uh, but it's not artificial. 99.9% uh, because we could be wiped out. No, no, but that, the question is whether it's whether yeah, even in principle. All right, all right. Whether, right. Some, whether I mean, if we've got salt. So we've, we've, we've kind of argued about it a bit. Well, <laughs> you can, people who disagree with the figure I've put in can go to their, can actually go to this web application and do it themselves. So you're putting in. So I've put in 99%, I've pressed next, and I'm now waiting for it. I <laughs> doesn't believe you. Right, now this is the famous Moore's Law, okay? So here, people should be able to see these little white circles, right? Can, can people see those? Yeah. yeah. Those are the actual data points. I don't know if they're all of the actual data points, but certainly um, a good selection of them. Um, of computers and uh, the cost per flop per dollar, I believe. Flop flops per dollar, yes. Um, and uh, this red line is a straight line that's been drawn through them on this log scale, so it's an exponential. And then you can move this black line here, right? You can move that. And that allows you to predict when you think Moore's Law will probably stop. And the green line and the red line, what are they doing? Well, actually, instead of saying that a specific year that it will stop, you're actually defining a probability distribution for when it will stop. And in this case, I believe it's, uh, it's log normal, so it's normal on logarithmic scale. Um, so uh, let's, let, let's go with that. So that's saying it's, uh, it's probably going to stop in around uh, 2060, 2070. Okay. And then you can put in how much computing power is required for neuromorphic or brain-like AI. So if you're very sure, you can have a, a very peaked probability distribution. You need exactly 10 to the 17 flops. And again, this is something that I'm sure you've all heard arguments about. So we, we can have maybe quite a shallow distribution like that with, with a big variance, a big standard deviation. And how much funding will the largest neuromorphic AI projects have to build computers with in the next decade? And, and suppose you weren't sure about one of these. What you can do is you can, you can go down here and you'll find claims from, say, this, this leading neuroscientist, and uh, you'll find um, a reference, and you can actually just press the load distribution button. So 
somebody's interpreted his, his claim as a probability distribution, and you can just press load, and there you go, right? And then we can say, okay, I, I believe him. Now, one thing you can't do is you can't average over the distributions of the experts, which would really be what you should do, which is sort of frustrating, but never mind. You can do that manually, though. Um, when will we have enough brain imaging technology to build neural multiplication? So you can see what's going on here. We're, we're getting people to submit probability distributions for these various claims. And if people aren't sure themselves, they can look at what the experts have actually said. So, so this is really the way I think you should do futurism. You should do it by taking expert opinions, uninformative prior distributions, updating your your relatively unbiased prior on the opinions of, or ho hopefully the average of the opinions of the accredited experts, and then going through and, and calculating a final value for the probability of the event that you're interested in, or the distribution of the event that you're interested in. So there we go. The, the numbers we've put in have given us this probability distribution for um, when AI will happen, right? So it's saying really close to zero in the next five years, doesn't really get off zero until we get to about 2030. I don't believe that at all. This is this is far too low. Not enough model on Sorry? Is that for 99%? So for 99% to start, yeah? That, was, that, it's, that it's possible in principle, but just because it's possible in principle doesn't mean it'll actually have happened next year. It yeah, might take an, until here, and, and it's saying here the chance is still only sort of 30% or something. And that's because of the other data that you filled in, like how, how much processing does yeah. it need to take, how much spend will there be. Exactly. And if you've got different views about that, then you get different answers. Exactly. So as we, as we go further through this, you know, you can then enter a probability distribution for what they call non-neuromorphic AI, so um, just ordinary software AI, right? And you can put that in, and then again, you can, you can load your, your favorite probability distribution. There we go. And then it combines those, and you can see the thing has sort of taken off more steeply now. So I, I probably won't actually bore you with more of the app, but as you can see, if you if you go through this yourself, you can really play around with it, right? You can you can see what probabilities you get from the, the beliefs that you have. So I'm just going to switch over. So what was that URL? That was www.theuncertainfuture.com. Uh, and who wrote that application, by the way? It's the Singularity Institute. So it's. I didn't actually do the coding. Um, I, I, yes. So I've demonstrated that. This is Linux, is it? What should I do with the blinds? Are you happy with them? Can you tune them a little bit, Okay, so uh, obviously this application has some weaknesses. Um, it's, it's a simplification of the future, as any model has to be. This is quite a crude simplification, very crude. In fact. I don't believe it. It's that crude. Um, there's no easy way to average over the expert opinions, which is problematic. You can't change the model, you can only change the parameters. So you have to enter parameters like mean and variance for a normal distribution, but you can't have a different distribution. Is it quick? Yes. Go. Even if you average over the opinions, you have to make the decision which ones, or someone else has put those up there, you have to decide how it's to, true. to give each one. But, we, but, we, but I mean, we have ways of accrediting experts, right? I mean, like, this is a professor. He appeared in the national press, that kind of thing. So it, obviously it's not perfect, right? <laughs> you know, if somebody is a professor at a reputable university and they were quoted in the Times, then, you know, that's better than picking a person at random. It's not perfect. It's far from perfect. Professors who speak outside their fields of uh, expertise often uh, get mm -hmm. things wrong as well. Often get things, often get things wrong, you know, but, but then again, probably better than asking just a passerby. Um, so, yes, it's also perhaps a little bit cumbersome, but, but anyway, you know, it does something. So, as I said, you, you really want to go beyond a single model, right? You want to have more than one model. So maybe you go through the uncertain future and you put in the values that you think are best. Maybe you run it a few times with different values, and then you average the probability distributions that you get out of that. 
But then maybe you go and ask some experts and take their opinions as well and include them into your, your mixture. And that's called a mixture model approach. Okay, that's, that's a well-known technique in statistics. Um, so, sort of once you've done all of that, it, it does come down to um, some amount of judgment calls as to what, you know, how should you weight different experts? How should you weight different calculations? So unfortunately, it sort of all looks a little bit unscientific. It's a subjective probability, it's Bayesian. Well, but, but anyway, let's, let's just go for it. What do I actually believe? So I spent some time thinking about this. And this is the probability distribution that I decided to settle on for myself after thinking about it sort of you know, provisionally for a while. And I've, I've decided that uh, for having uh, AI that can outcompete most humans in the workforce, um, conditional on not having um, a disaster, I, I decided that it was pretty unlikely in, in the next decade, still pretty unlikely, you know, really maybe reaching 50-50 uh, by sort of you know, around about 2017. Um, but that's just one person, that's just me. So what did other people think? So here we have some, some graphs from other people. This one is uh, Steve Rayhawk. This is Stephen Cast. These are people at the Singularity Institute. Uh, this is just a simple uh, uninformed prior. Um, it's basically this Laplace's law of succession thing. And this, this yellow one is me again. So there is some spread here. There's actually quite, quite significant spread. Here in 2040, me and Steve Rayhawk disagree from 30% to 70%. Well, that's a pretty big disagreement. Where's Eliezer's? <laughs> uh, oh, he was busy. He didn't have time to talk. <laughs> um, so, yeah, there's, there's some dispersion there. And if, if you actually asked sort of most AI scientists who, who work at computer science departments, they'd probably be sort of down here, right? I mean, they would not assign very much problem. But it might depend on whether you ask them in public or in private. Mm -hmm. um, Scientists. I'm sort of an academic. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of an AI scientist, but I'm not an academic. Uh, only, yeah, okay, that, that's cool. M maybe at the end, at the end, because I, I really want to go through it quickly. Um, okay, so other technologies. What do I believe about other technologies? Have I done the same exercise? No, not with the same amount of, of, of work and effort. Um, but I, I would say that for something like advanced nanotech, it would probably be, you know, look roughly the same as what I have for AI. Um, yeah, maybe the same for something like, you know, longevity, escape velocity, these kinds of things. Um, also, there are correlations between technologies that, that just having a single distribution doesn't really get to. So, for example, if you have a cognitive technology, if you have something like um, genetic engineering that makes humans smarter, then that actually accelerates the development of other technologies, probably. And if you go through to the final questions of the Uncertain Future web app, it actually includes that effect, it models that in a crude way. Um, and what about the long run? So, I mean, you know, probability of AI this century, but what about the eventual fate of the human race, that kind of thing? Well, we, you know, we have these exciting predictions that you might find in the singularity is near, that we're all going to be gods by 2025 in May, you know, <laughs> by lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, those might not pan out. I, I mean, they, they probably won't pan out. Uh, they're, they're far too specific, anyway. Um, but on the other hand, a lot of people, I mean, if you just sort of ask most people who are not at all involved with the futurism community, but are intelligent enough to, for you to expect them to have a sensible opinion, they ultimately tend to sort of believe that the future will kind of be an indefinite extension of the present, maybe with a few like, different gadgets. Flying cars. It, it, flying cars, right? I mean, yeah. In, 2100 will have flying cars, you know. Um, we already have those. <laughs> um, but even if we had, like, proper flying cars that everyone used, that would still be kind of an indefinite extension of the present. I mean, you know, the kind of things that, that maybe Nick Bostrom is thinking about in the future is, are we all going to have, you know, uploaded ourselves onto computers, forked off into a million different personality forks each? I mean, that is a really radical future prediction. It might not happen, but certainly this idea of, of, well, the future's just going to be like now, except that the calendar's going to be different. It's, it's really untenable with, with you know, the, the, the sort of on-the-ground nature of scientific progress. And if you look back a hundred years, you can see just how much change there has been. You know, I mean, if you, if you went to 1910, you know, we barely invented aeroplanes. 
you know, most people probably didn't have electricity. Computers, I mean, nobody had even thought of them. Maybe Babbage, but you know, he got ignored. I mean, that's that's a really you know, significant change. So Nick Bostrom, um, in his paper, The Future of Humanity, which is a great paper, I, I definitely recommend people go to Nick Bostrom's website and download The Future of Humanity and read it. It's quite readable. Um, says that, that if you think about it in the long run, right, it doesn't seem particularly plausible that we will remain in a society where the smartest beings are around are human beings forever. And there's two ways we can go, really, as, as far as he says. One is to a sort of post-human state, a state where maybe the smartest entities around are human uploads or, you know, vastly smart AIs or something like that, or that we could become extinct or we could be sort of nuked back to the Stone Age or something. So the current state is not going to be around forever, sort of asymptotic. So what does this mean? What should we do? And sometimes you can, you can think about what you can do even if you don't have a sharp probability, if, even if you don't have an exact expectation about what's going to happen. Because what you can do is you can, you can have contingencies, you can have plans that will work relatively well even if, you know, even if there's like five significant possibilities that you think could, could happen in the future. So one of these is, is that we should be spending money and time as a society thinking about how to make advanced technologies that you might hear about within transhumanist circles, how to make sure they're safe, how to make sure they don't do damage, serious damage, to our civilization. And to a certain extent, people have started that with, with biotechnology, um, because that's sort of more near term. But I, but I don't think nearly enough, considering the, the consequences of, of, a, of a genetically engineered virus. I mean, people. I don't know how many people heard about this, but an Australian research group posted um, the, the DNA sequence of a genetically modified virus that had been found to be sort of 90 or 100% lethal in rabbits onto the internet. I can't remember what the virus was. Was it mousepox? Something, something like that. So you, you, could have, you could have used that for, you know, you could, you could have used the scientific paper that they posted relatively easily to try and make a virus that was 90 or 100 percent lethal to humans, and they just posted it onto the internet. So, things need to be done. So, if there are technologies that can't be made particularly safe, we can think about either surveillance to make sure we can catch anybody who's trying to do anything dangerous, prevention of risky uses if there's some way we can sort of block it off from happening, or countermeasures in case something bad does happen. And, and maybe we should think about, I mean, a lot of people, you know, we've had the ID card system scrapped. Maybe people should think about changing their attitude to surveillance at least a little bit and saying, well, you know, advanced technologies make the downside to individual liberty larger than it was previously. I mean, you know, previous arguments, people might have said the government needs to have surveillance technology because if somebody's like an axe murderer, maybe we can catch them before they kill 10 people. But now the argument is the government needs surveillance technology because if somebody is angry and they're a biotech researcher, they can engineer a virus that will kill everyone, which is a stronger argument. And I'm not saying how much that should move you, but I think that's certainly something we should consider. Ways to make human beings smarter seems to me, and, and I think a couple of other people, Julian Savulescu, from Oxford University has also said this. After me, though. <laughs> <laughs> Note. <laughs> uh, that, that engineering humans to be smarter, so finding some kind of maybe genetic modification, maybe something like, um, you know, embryo <clears throat> selection or even a retrovirus or something like that that could, that could change our genetics to make us more intelligent, have higher IQs. Or maybe just some kind of pharmaceutical I doubt it's possible, but it could be. You know, that seems like it would be a big win. It would mitigate an awful lot of possible risks, and it would also increase the benefits of many technologies if we could make the decision-making process of our society, which is democracy, better by making the participants, ordinary people, more intelligent, more able to think about these complex issues. And lastly, knee-jerk reactions, which I think, to be honest, I, I suspect we will see in this coming century, they're going to happen, but they're a bad idea. So, so one example of this was uh, Nick and Anders from Oxford University worked out that there are more scientific papers on dung beetle reproduction 
the normal risk of human extinction. And I actually checked this or something. It may have been this one or something very close to it on Google Scholar, and it's true. Mm -hmm. You know, like the amount of research on just beetles, just, I think it's cle kleptology, isn't it, or something? The technical term for it. Beetle collection. It's huge. It's tens of thousands of papers, but human papers on how to mitigate the risk of human extinction, you know, a very small number of papers, and I've read most of them, right? I mean, I, I, I looked through these results, and I was like, yeah, red, 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 irrelevant, irrelevant, you know, typo, red, red, and that was it. So, I mean, I think this highlights that, that our society has a lack of attention and resource to its own survival. Now, in some cases, we do, in fact, react to perceived threats to our survival. Um, just, just before I talk about shelters, you know, the UK spent or has, has allocated and, and or spent 20 billion to the Iraq and Afghan wars. The US, look at that! Look at all those zeros! There's 12 of them! That's how much money the US has, has allocated to those wars. They've already spent a billion and there's another two that's predicted to be spent. 12 zeros worth of spend on those wars. And you have to ask yourself, you know, is that really worth it? How many Americans did Iraq kill? None as far as I know. Um, but, you know, we're not prepared to have more to pay for, you know, anybody researching the risks that advanced AI could pose. That there, you know, the US government is paying nobody. They think that the optimal allocation of money is three trillion to killing people, you know, on the other side of the world, and zero to dealing with the possibility that maybe computers could reproduce the functionality of the human brain and that, that could be a threat. Which is not sane. And I, I don't think this figure of 20 billion you know, from the UK is particularly sane, given that there are all sorts of things we could do to mitigate existential risks that would kill far more people than either Iraq or Afghanistan ever threatened to do. So this, just this example I, I was given here was shelters, right? I mean, we, we could build shelters that would house enough people, resources, power generation, food, etc to survive major disasters such as biotech or a nuclear war going wrong. Um, we haven't done it, and it wouldn't, it would probably cost a, a small fraction of the amount of money we've spent on Iraq. And it could save, you know, tens of thousands of people. It could save our country, as it were. But Is US, it quick? But the US has spent money on nuclear fallout shelters. For the general population? Well, they have spent some money. They have, it's they it's true they have spent some, but you have to ask, you know, I mean, would those shell? I mean, I they I know they had shelters for top government officials that would survive. You know, the the, the, the short period after a nuclear war. Um, there's a great documentary I think um, called Threads. I don't know if anyone's seen it. That was made in the UK about nuclear war, and it, it sort of showed what what would have happened if the East West had had a nuclear war. And yes, there were shelters, right? You know, officials were protected with limited supplies of food for some time. But if you look in that documentary, and I don't know how scientifically accurate it was, that documentary was predicting that 10 years after the nuclear war, we would, in the UK, be reduced to medieval peasants. Because, you know, the shelters were holes with a fixed amount of food supply in them. And eventually people would have to come out. When they came back out, they would find that industrial society was ruined. There would be a mass die-off. Almost everyone would die. And those who were left would be peasants. Now, we could do better than that. We could have a shelter large enough to restart our society, you know, from scratch, with machinery, with power generation, with a large community of people on the ground. But we haven't done that, and I don't think the US has. Well, they might have done it in secret, but... Um, well, I was just trying to make point, it's not like... It's true. It's, it's true. not like three trillion zeros. It's, it's not... It's not... Some number. It's, it's, it's sort of almost zero. Like on a scale where this was three trillion, it, it would be. Yeah. Um, okay, so so that's enough about me whining about the fact that our society maybe isn't paying enough attention to these problems or these potential problems. Um, what about the implications for individuals? What can you do to help yourself, and what can you do to help other people? So I think the first point I wanted to make. I don't know whether, can we have the blinds down a bit for this? Go on, indulge me. Mm -hmm. The first point I wanted to make was that the, the gain, or its expected utility technically, of surviving into a future that was sort of the other side of a major 
technological revolution whereby we could actually keep people alive indefinitely. We could stop people from aging at all. We could stop diseases. We could stop almost all accidents. The benefit to you as an individual of surviving to that future would be, would be huge. So, so look, here, here's, a, here's a circle whose, whose surface area is proportional to a, a billion years. And it is actually about a billion pixels in, in the original JPEG. Um, and I don't know if anyone can see this. Can I go and see that tiny black dot there? Yeah, vaguely. So if you, this is the, the proportion of, of how long your life would be if you get to the point of what Aubrey de Grey calls longevity escape velocity, compared to how long it would be if you don't. Right? I mean, that is an awesome comparison. And you, I think it's good that we've got the overhead projector because you can actually see it. Right? It's like comparing a grain of sand to, to like a, a massive sort of, I don't know, a sort of cosmic cannonball. Right? The, the, the scale of, of individual benefit from you individually surviving through to a positive high technology future, what we might call positive post-singularity, is huge. And I think a lot of people just don't, don't really factor this into their, to their everyday activities. Um, you know, it's, it's, like, it's like the difference between living your life and living for one second. Uh, this diagram hugely understates it, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhat. I was going to say, really, you're comparing a finite number to infinity. Well, not infinity. I, I mean, in expectation, this is infinity. But, I mean, let's sort of cut the infinity off. You know, let's, just say, let's just say, assume that if you live through to a stage beyond longevity escape velocity, you will then live for a billion years. And well, then would die. you want to? You might not want to. Look, look, think about the condition. <laughs> this shows, it's just comparing, it's like if you become almost immortal, you'll become almost immortal. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Uh, it's, like, it's just showing you how much bigger a billion it is than a hundred. Yeah. <laughs> uh, essentially. And that's not actually taking into account the, you know, the possible increase in thinking speed. So, so you, you could be speeded up, yeah. In, in which case it would be an even larger comparison. And also, just the quality of life over time historically has improved a lot. I mean, the, the, the quality of life a thousand years ago for, for most people who weren't nobility was, was awful by today's standards. No, 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 no. You may think you're just because they don't have televisions and cars didn't mean to have an awful life. They sat, they drank their beer, they had time. They had lots of time for doing things and for playing with each other and not worrying about people coming around the spine on them all the time. Uh, you, you, you know, what are these judgments you're saying? You know, oh. What are you measuring this against? So, they didn't have to sit in, in huge towns, squashed up against each other, but be run over by cars. They didn't have like toilets or clean water. Or they had clean so, water. I mean, may, maybe, you know, maybe we should take this particular... It's a good point. It shouldn't be skipped over lightly. But I think it's better if we take it to the end so that we can finish. What's, mm -hmm. How's our time doing? It's 20 to 4. Right. So another um, yeah. 5 minutes and then Q&A. Yeah. So as, as a side note, just to sort of underscore this point about how much you could individually benefit from there not being a global catastrophe, actually being what you might call rationally selfish, never mind rationally helping others, as opposed to being a what I would call a pot plant, a person who sort of does what everyone else around them is doing, kind of responds passively. You know, everyone else is like watching TV, so I'm going to watch TV. Like everyone else thinks that the future is going to be basically an indefinite extension of the present, so that's what I'm going to think too. Actually being rationally selfish, being saying I want the absolute best for myself, you know, it requires genuine motivation above and beyond what most people have, and it requires an intellectual passion, an intellectual commitment to thinking rationally that most people just underestimate. So I'm going to list now six things you can do starting now to help yourself and others based upon what I think and what I think you would probably come to conclude the future is going to be like. So first of all, survival, right? This diagram I had before with the two circles. You know, surviving to the point when we reach longevity escape velocity is great for yourself. It's, it's also good for other people because they, they probably don't want you to die. Um, if you don't discount your future by more than a really severe amount, then it's almost certainly what I might call selfishly rational to dedicate a significant amount of your life, if not all of it, to reducing one of these, these extinction risks. Because if you think 
you've got 10 to the 9 years after the singularity or after some kind of technological revolution, and you, 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 you discount that by some factor, and you think that delta P is the, is the difference that you personally can make in the risk of the world being taken out by, by such a disaster. If you think that that multiplies again to greater than one year, you should spend a year on it. Right? And, and, and if delta P, if, if the, the difference in probability, the change that you could personally make, is, is bigger than one part in 100,000, which is not unreasonable, considering there are so few people and so few resources dedicated, then just for your own self-interest, you should do it. Never mind the fact that it's, it's a massive win for other people. You'd be saving you know, billions of lives, even if with only a small probability. So, so two, I'm going to say, think very carefully about things. And this is, this is something that's sort of counterintuitive. You know, the, the value of, of better thought, the value of realizing what the most important thing to do is, is huge in this case. The stakes are very high, we're very uncertain, so you should think a lot. And this is not best done low. It's best done with other people who can provide good, high-quality criticisms of your ideas and give you good ideas yourself. So I might come back to this at the end. The Singularity Institute is doing a visiting fellows program. So you can go over to California or maybe in the future come somewhere in the UK and you know go to a house and spend some time off maybe you know, like a sort of holiday, thinking about these things, brainstorming, writing papers, etc. So, leading on from that, join a community. A group of people can do so much more good than just an individual. Even, even if you add up the contributions of a number of individuals, the group will do more than that totally. And there is an emerging community of people who are doing things about thinking rationally about the future. And less wrong is really a good starting point. Four, money. If you've got more of it, it's good. Why is it good? It's good because in this world, if you want to get things done, if you want to be able to hand over pieces of paper and cause other people to do things that will reduce existential risks rather than sitting around and watching TV, you have to have those little pieces of paper with pictures of the Queen on them in the first place. And the more of them you have, the better. So I think a lot of people who take so an interest in... you shouldn't have a high taxation. <laughs> Sorry? So therefore you shouldn't have a high taxation. This well, is really this personal policy. This is, this is, this is personal yeah. policy. Yeah, so, so, this, so this is what you in particular can do. Yes, we have relatively high taxes in this country, though it could be worse, you could be in Scandinavia. Um, Better. Let's not go there. Yes. Um, so, if you can make money, you can donate it, for example, to organisations that turn money into a reduced probability of a technological disaster happening. Organisations such as the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford University. And, you know, the the figures that we're talking about are not particularly big here. FHI, we calculated, can employ um, an extra one person out of like two or three they've got already with about 100,000 pounds. That's not very much. I mean, to, you know, if we've got, say, three people in the whole United Kingdom who are thinking about how to stop high technology risks of these particular forms, adding one person for 100,000 pounds is rather good value for money especially good value for money if you see yourself as somebody who wants to help other people, who wants to prevent the deaths of many people from some kind of catastrophe or even from natural causes such as aging. So a great way that you can facilitate this, that you can actually do something, is to go to xrisknetwork.com where a group of people have come together to to sort of advise each other, to help each other in the task of trying to raise money for existential risk charities. Five, I think you've probably all heard this, sign up for cryonics. Um, it's probably a good idea. Um, if, you're, if you're older, it's, it's an especially good idea. If you're younger, my suspicion is the range of scenarios that it saves you is relatively slim. Maybe only 20% of the scenarios will you actually end up using it. Um, but it's not very expensive, so it's probably a good thing to do. And if you do this, why not support the Cryonics UK movement? We've had David Stiles to speak about that. You know, they're a young movement. They can use support in terms of volunteering. I'm sure they can use financial support. And the growth of that movement will directly affect your personal chances of surviving if you're signed up. And it will also affect the chance of surviving of many other people who are signed up and who aren't. 
So growing and supporting the Quranics movement, definitely a good idea. And academics getting a PhD in an in academic discipline, you know, this gives you leverage, it gives you the ability to, to, to tell people sensible things and for then those people to look at your credentials and then listen to you because it says PhD after you. Um, it's hard to do well. Academia is very competitive, but if you can, it's worth doing. But finally, do I think that given this picture of the future that I've illustrated, do I think there's hope for our future? And I think there is definitely hope. I mean, I, I got quite despondent about this maybe sort of a couple of months ago, but I, I thought about it again and I thought, no, there really is a great amount of, of goodness that could come. Um, and there are many considerations, you know, when you think things are quite bad, remember there are many considerations that you probably haven't thought of that might flip things a bit so that things actually aren't so bad. So, and those considerations seem to be coming in at about one per decade. The last one we had was the need for friendly AI, which I spoke about before. So, yes, there is definitely hope. Um, there is a sizable chance of things going wrong, but we have organisations such as the Singularity Institute and the Future of Humanity Institute and the Lifeboat Foundation, and we're doing things and we're growing. More and more people are becoming involved and, and that's something that you can become involved in too. So before I say goodbye, references, really crucial. X Risk Network and Less Wrong, really definitely worth visiting both of those, I would say, if you want to personally make a difference to help yourself and to help others. Thank you for listening. <laughs>